We're currently in the middle of a global pandemic, and today's guest, Dennis Carroll, chases diseases around the world in an effort to prevent the next big one. We animated this video short because we did the interview remotely while he was overseas chasing influenza. Enjoy. Is it accurate to say that you travel around the world chasing the flu? That's kind of what it seems like. Well, not just the flu, but largely emerging viral diseases, flu, coronaviruses, philo, you know, Ebola's, things like that, yeah. Usually trying to anticipate the new ones, like this COVID 2019. So some influenza viruses are very, very well equipped to infect humans. Others are not, but may be incredibly lethal so, for instance, H5N1, that had everyone's attention 15 years ago, the avian flu virus, 60 to 70% of the people who are infected by it die. Very, very, very lethal. And so if you have a really unlucky person who is infected with the seasonal flu and then becomes exposed to, say, H5N1 and gets simultaneous infection with an H5N1, then there's a real risk they swap genetic material. Bingo, ah. you're in trouble. <laughs> and the people around that individual now are vulnerable to being infected. And then we're in deep kimchi. It took us somewhere 300, 400,000 years to hit the billion mark. A hundred years ago, there were 1.8 billion people. So in one century, 100 years, we added another 6 billion. So even if it took us 300,000 years to hit the billion mark, we've been able to add 6 billion in just 10 decades. That's 6 billion people. Yeah, right? yeah. So we're at 7.8 billion. And by the time we get to the end of this century, we're going to be right on the edge of 12 billion. Oh, my God. People will say things like, ah, oh, massive pandemic. What are the odds? This never happened before. But it has happened before. For example, the 1918 flu at the end of World War I, soldiers were spreading the virus and we had, was it 50 to 100 million deaths back then? That was 50 to 100 million deaths when the world's population was 1.8 billion. Ah. So think about it today. We also have hundreds of thousands of these viruses circulating in wildlife that have the potential to infect people. The thing about viruses is that they're always sort of a Darwinian sort of directive for all life, including humans, is diversify your ecosystems. Because if you have only one ecosystem that you're dependent on and that ecosystem gets wiped out, then you go extinct. Humans, Homo sapiens, originally we were limited to parts of Africa. And then we began to migrate out and we diversified our habitats rather remarkably. We're all over the planet. Jeff Bezos and all that are looking to get us out to Mars and beyond, they're also trying to diversify our habitats. Viruses do the same thing. They're always trying to move from one animal species to another. Humans are within that. More and more spillover of these long-existent but unknown viruses in animal populations, wildlife, are making their way into domestic and human populations. So a new influenza virus that is transmissible and is deadly, that is what will then sweep around the world as a pandemic. There was the pandemic of 2009. There are these nice maps that show the speed with which the virus moved out of Mexico and largely by air swept around the world. It was first identified in April. By the end of June, it was virtually on every continent on the planet. Wow. That's incredibly fast. terrifying. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, fast. It's fast. So the speed with which an influenza virus can move is staggering. Were a virus to emerge today, within one year, a year later, two billion people would likely be infected. And if it were as lethal as the 1918, which had a mortality rate of 3%, when you've got 2 billion people that are infected, 3% mortality, you're talking about hundreds of millions of people. Oh, my God. And that virus spreads far faster than our ability to produce a vaccine. By the time it spreads around the world, we're going to just begin to get enough vaccine to protect only a quarter of the world's population. The fact of the matter is time marches on. Whatever we look at, 
around us and think is the norm. That will not be the case 10 years from now, 20 years from now, much less 100 or 1,000 years from now. When you look at ancient civilizations, they looked around the world exactly the same way we do. They thought what they saw is exactly what always was and always will be. The societies we live in today that we take for granted will be a footnote in history 500 years from now. The architecture that we surround ourselves with, they will be ruins or forgotten a thousand years from now. Rome was known as the eternal city. And you look at the form and you look at it today, and it's hard to imagine that it was the equivalent of Wall Street today. We know that these viruses already exist and they're circulating in wildlife. So part of a proactive stance is to go out and begin developing a comprehensive catalog of what is circulating in wildlife. If we've documented and characterized virtually all of the coronaviruses circulating in wildlife before they move into people, can we be thinking about broad spectrum vaccines or as we are trying to do with the influenza virus, a universal coronavirus vaccine. That, to me, is the future. When Franklin D. Roosevelt was talking about the Depression, he could have just as easily have been talking about a pandemic event, which is that you have nothing to fear but fear itself. Fear itself can be the most damning consequence of a pandemic. It's not a question of if. There will be epidemics. There will be pandemics. It is a question of when. Hope you all enjoyed that. For more and for the full interview, check out the Jordan Harbinger Show episode with Dennis Carroll in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen now. Click here for another animated interview, somebody who's getting sued by a patent troll. It could happen to you. And click here to subscribe to the channel.